what I'm talking about. Wait. Okay, now, from the beginning. Mosley and I welcome here, you here today. I am Pastor Brian's other half. We are partners in ministry and it is a joy for me to be able to share with you this morning. If today is your first day at the Springs, we welcome you. Um, guys, this is our family. We moved here from Tennessee four and a half years ago knowing no one and we consider the people in this room our family. They pray with us. They come alongside us. And so if you are searching for a place to call home, I invite you in. Everyone here invites you in. And if, you are, if you've been coming here for a while and you're a part of the family, I love you. Thank you for your prayers. I know that last night Brian sent out um, a prayer request for me because I was pretty much in tears with my head feeling like it was going to explode with, I'm assuming, a sinus infection. And um, it had been brewing and it got to the point of severity where I'm like, um, you might need like a backup plan for tomorrow. But as soon as he sent out that prayer request, I know that people immediately started praying for me and, um, I started feeling better. Um, it was pretty amazing. And this morning I woke up and I could breathe out of one nostril. It was awesome. <laughs> and, um, so if I sound a little different today, that is why my ears are very much clogged Everything is muffled in here, so if I'm too loud, Tim's going to turn me down because we already know that I am loud, and then you can't hear, and then I'm going to get louder. Um, to our people watching on YouTube, um, we love you. Thank you for tuning in today. And um, this morning, as Brian was talking with me, I said, um, or he said, you know, you've got to make a decision if you are going to speak today or not. So um, I stopped and we prayed together, and I just did not feel a release and a peace in my heart to stay at home. So um, I'm breathing out of both nostrils now. It's pretty amazing. And um, like Pastor Rory told me, he is such an encourager. If you've not gotten a chance to get to know Pastor Rory, I encourage you to. He came up to me this morning and he said, these people love you, and this is not a performance. This is family, and this is where you are sharing the word of God. You do not have to put on any kind of show. You be you. You be sick. You be sharing the word. It's fine. And so that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to share the word of the Lord that I believe that he has given for us today. Um, we are in the third week of the names of God. Last week, Pastor B, as I affectionately call him, um, shared about Elohim. And he talked about how... You know, sometimes we view God as like the big man upstairs and the doting grandfather and we can do no wrong and the, um, oh, the, the landlord. What was that one? The, laps, the absent landlord. And those are things that we manufacture in our mind. We've got to go to the word of God to find out who he is because a lot of times we have misconceptions from things that we've heard. I grew up hearing all the time, the big man upstairs. Well, I was terrified of the big man upstairs because that just does not sound uh, very inviting. So today we're going to look into the names of God and why study the names of God? Well, the names of God reveal his character. They reveal who he is. They reveal his attributes. And there's many different names of God. And you know what? Last week, what Pastor Brian talked about, you may not have been in that season. 
but I bet you might be at some point in time. So you take that information and you put it in your pocket for when you're going to need it. What I'm talking about today, there are going to be some people that are going to say, yes, absolutely, I get that. That's what I needed. That's what I needed to hear. And some of you aren't at this place, but put it in your pocket and go to the word of God when you hit that point where you need to know that, that he is our provider, that that is his character. It's who he is. The more we know God, the more we will love him. Um, they put this table and chair up here for me because they were afraid that I was going to pass out and um, be able to stand today. But like my hands, I think I have to walk around in order for my brain to think. Like I can't talk without my hands, and I think I need to walk for my brain to function as well. So I've got my chair in case I need to see it, or not see it, sit in it. There you go. You're with me. Um, I want to tell you guys about something special that happened this week. Um, my schedule is crazy, as is yours. I am. Um, I, I, I work. I teach children in China English. Um, and it is amazing. And today, while we were worshiping, um, I'm thinking about the freedom, the opportunity that we have to come together to worship so freely. And when I look on the computer screen at my sweet babies over in China, they don't have that opportunity. And it breaks my heart, but I get to pray for them. And I get to pray that they will be able to worship. I get to pray that they will know that God is their Lord and their Savior. Um, so I just don't, I don't want us to take that for granted, that we get to come into these four walls every week and come into this room with other believers, and we get to worship freely, without abandon. It's, it's amazing. So let that sink in for a minute. But this week, um, I, I work. I teach my children at home because I might be a little crazy. Um, I am Brian's wife. I help as much as I can with ministry. Um, I had children, so my house gets destroyed on the daily. Um, I'm a cook. I'm a maid. I'm a taxi. All of the things, right? Moms, you can attest to that. Um, but this week, I was supposed to take the dogs to the groomer, and Brian was like, I'll take the dogs to the groomer for you. I was like, oh, I love him so much. And um, I was on the phone with a friend who had called to ask for some advice, and she's like, what? He's taking the boys and the dogs to the groomer? Do you want to go get coffee? And that never happens for me, that I can just drop everything and go have coffee with a friend. But now that I... On the other side of it, I see exactly what the Lord was doing. So I had one kid with me. He was fine. And she had one kid with her. And we got coffee and got them cookies. And they were watching things on the phone so they don't disturb everybody midday in Starbucks who's gone there to, like, study or work or whatever. And then we roll in with children. Um, if you've been one of those people, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> But she sat and she was just casually talking to me and she was, I've watched her grow. She's a very dear friend of mine. I've watched her grow over the years. And um, she was telling me that she had been doing their taxes. And she said, you know, her husband had gone a while without a job. He lost his job. And I talked, when I talked a few weeks ago, I alluded to this sweet family then as well. And I've asked for permission. Again, I don't ever want to share someone's story without permission. Um, so she was just telling me that um, when she was doing her taxes for last year, 2018, she's like, I was blown away, not because they, of all the money they made, but because of when you see it on paper and you see the number on paper and you see what you did make after you've gone through a couple of job losses and then time without a job. And she said, and the weird thing is, Ashley, when I was doing it, we also gave to the Lord more than we ever had before. Like, it doesn't add up, right? That math doesn't add up. And she's like, and we never went without anything that we needed. Yeah. Ever. And they even had some things that they wanted thrown in there. And my sweet friend's husband has now got a job that is providing so well for their family. And I really strongly believe that the Lord positioned them along the way until he got this job. Like, it was all about position, and the Lord positions us. And sometimes when we're walking through that valley, getting to that position of the Lord, um, it can feel really lonely, and it can feel really dark, and it can feel super-duper scary. 
And so as she kept talking, and she's like, it just doesn't make sense. And I'm like, it's God, right? She's like, it's totally God, because it doesn't, it doesn't add up. And and now that sweet family has been hit with some things happening at their home and some unexpected expenses. And she was telling me that her husband had just gotten paid the day before. And she's like, that tithe check was really hard to write. Like she has seen his faithfulness all throughout 2018. But because of those unexpected things that come along the way, that tithe, that tithe check was really hard to write. But guess what? They wrote it anyway. She finished her taxes the very next day, and this time she was blown away again, but blown away with what God did. He gave them the largest tax return that he, they have ever gotten, where it's like looking at it and double-taking and like, what did you do right there, Lord? What if she had not written that tithe check the day before? That sounded really Southern. That tithe check the day before. What if she had not written that the day before? Would they have gotten that blessing the next day? God is faithful. You cannot outgive him. Today, he, we are talking about him being Jehovah Jireh, our provider. They walked through some really hard times, and, and the Lord proved himself. And now their testimony encourages others. Their testimony encourages me. Because I've seen up close, firsthand, had a front row seat. And they are thriving, and the Lord is working through them. So let me go back to my notes here. Their loving obedience, the Lord was able to show his faithful provision. The two go hand in hand. Today, I'm not going to talk about money. I know some of you are thinking, oh my gosh, she's talking about money again. I'm not talking about money today. But money is one of those, those possessions that we hold very tightly to. And we say, it's mine, 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 mine. And sometimes the Lord is asking us to stand with open hands and let him provide even more for us. Okay, so I think many of us know what God has said about himself, but we don't believe it. We don't believe him. We wait to feel like God is enough before believing he actually is. And when the feelings don't come, we assume that God has not come either. But I'm here today to tell you that we cannot base who God is off of our feelings. They will fail us every single time. Our emotions cannot drive us. Who God says he is must drive us. We must believe he is who he says he is. The, God's revelation of himself to us is what we trust in the difficult times. This is exactly why it is so important to know his names from scripture and study who he is. So I want to ask you guys a question today. I think it's something that probably most of us will say yes to. Do you need God's supernatural provision today? Do we need his divine intervention in a very specific way? What is it that you need today? Is it something for your marriage? Is it something for your finances, your family, your job, your relationships? What do you need God the provider for today? I know from experience that sometimes the needs in our lives seem to mount up really high. We've been through those seasons where the needs just keep piling and it feels like the weight of the world is on our shoulders. And maybe you've been waiting and maybe you've been praying. Maybe you've been praying for that loved one for years to come to know the Lord. Maybe you have been praying for that job for a really long time. Maybe you have been praying for that healing in your life. Whatever it is, you might get frustrated that God is not quick to provide. My friend, the other day, wrote the tithe check one day, and God provided the very next day. That's awesome. It doesn't always work like that. And we are going to see that as an example in Scripture today. So we are going to look at a story of the unimaginable. A lot of you know this account. A lot of you have been in church long enough. But I want to talk to the people out there that are like Ashley Mosley when I was 17 years old. I didn't know anything. I kind of knew about Noah, and that was it. I had heard about Jesus. Um, Easter was all about the Easter bunny for me. It was not 
iota anything about Jesus. It was about, I'm getting that Easter basket, and we're going to go Easter egg hunting and wear cute, frilly little dresses. My family never even went to church a whole handful of times that I can ever recall in my life. So if you're like me, and you're like, I, mm, I don't even know, this story comes from the very first book in the Bible. It's Genesis. And it's Genesis, um, starting somewhere around chapter 17, we meet a man and a woman, Abraham and Sarah. Now, Abraham and Sarah were married, and they wanted children, and they could not have children. Heartbreak. They wanted children. They prayed for children. They desired children. No children. And then later on in Scripture, um, they are visited by three men. One of them is the Lord, and Abraham does not realize this. And, and um, Abraham's sitting at the front of his tent, and Sarah is inside the tent, like, working. And, and Abraham sees these men and says, please let me give you some water and something to eat. Stay, relax a while. And so when Abraham serves them, the Lord says to Abraham, where is Sarah? Now, I don't know about you, but if I don't know these people and somebody asks me, where is Brian? Ooh, I'm going to be like, how did you know his name? And how did you know there's somebody else here that you don't see? But he said, she's in the tent. And then the Lord said to Abraham, I will come back in about a year and you and Sarah will have a child. Well, Sarah is in the tent and she hears this and she laughs. I would imagine it was like, <laughs> because Sarah was old. The Bible says she was past childbearing years. I imagine she had gray hair and wrinkles and that her body did not feel good when she woke up in the morning and like, what? I'm going to have a child? And she laughed because she thought that was humorous. Now, that's where I'm telling you, there is, they've been praying for a child for a long time. That answer did not come immediately. And that answer came when they felt like they were too far gone. Like, we're past this. Well, now, a year later, they came back, and there's old, wrinkly Sarah rocking a baby. And I'm sure she was elated to be rocking that baby. And I imagine me, if I even had a child now, I'd be like, Lord, I am too old for this. I need my sleep. But that baby was an answer to prayer. And that baby represented God's faithfulness. And I can only imagine how beside themselves they were. Now, oh, such a great story. Hey, guys, if you think the Bible is boring, I dare you to read it because it's anything but boring. It is full of excitement. It is full of adventure. It's full of, like, um, things that will make your eyes pop. I taught in Kids Spring last week, and we talked about um, King David and Bathsheba. And, oh, man, um, <laughs> read that story. I, I handled it well, parents, for your children. I did. Um, and let's take a look at Genesis 22. You can turn there in your Bible. You can find it on your phone. You can follow along the screen with me. Um, but we're going to look at this account of what happened. This was probably what I imagine to be the hardest ask, a gut-wrenching obedience. Abraham and Sarah finally have Isaac. They're, they dote over him. He's their only child. They waited what seemed like forever for him. And in Genesis 22:1, the Bible says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. Pause, please. Circle the word tested. I looked up the Greek for tested. It means tested. Um, <laughs> it's a promise that God is going to test us. The Bible does say that you shall not put the Lord God to a test, but he's our creator. He's going to test us. So if you've walked through a test, or you're in a test, or you're going to end up walking through a test, you're not alone. You're in good company. There were many people in the Word of God that were put to test. Our friend Abraham, for example. So Abraham, um, God called to him, Abraham, and Abraham replied, here I am. Not knowing what was going to come on the other side of this. Hey, Abraham, what's up? Then, verse 2, God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love. Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, 
sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain, I will show you. What? What? Told you the Bible's not boring. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. I don't want you to miss something very important in this part of scripture. Abraham responded with prompt obedience. Early the next morning, he got up. Um, guys, I love my children. I love them. They drive me crazy. Warner knows it. I love them. If God said to me, if God said to me, I need you to take your precious little Warner and I need you to go and sacrifice him, I'm pretty sure um, I'm going to argue with him. And like, did I hear you right? I'm not sure I heard that right. I think I need to pray about this for a while. God, are you sure? Do you mean like a literal sacrifice? Or are you talking figuratively? I'm going to be talking through it. Abraham got up early the next morning to go sacrifice the son that he had been praying for and waiting for a very long time. Prompt obedience is key there, guys. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Two things that I saw in this. He told his servants to stay. And I'm, I was looking into that and wondering, why did he tell his servants to say, I don't know, maybe he thought his servants were going to think that he was absolutely crazy and try to talk him out of sacrificing his son. He left the distractions behind. They weren't invited into this. This was between Abraham, Isaac, and the Lord. And so any distractions, any hindrances, they were going to stay because Abraham was going to be faithful to do what God had asked him to do. The second thing I see in this part of scripture is that he said, we will worship and then we will come back to you. I don't know if, Cra if um, Abraham was just in denial and just like, we're going to come back to you. But Abraham's a man of faith. He waited a long time for that child. He saw God work. And I think that he knew God's going to work again. And we are going to go and worship and we are going to come back to you. Maybe he thought, we're going to go and worship. Sacrificing in the Old Testament, burnt sacrifices were a form of worship. Because of Jesus and Jesus being the Lamb of God that was sacrificed for us, we don't have to do that anymore. But in the Old Testament, that's what you did. That was your sign of worship. Maybe Abraham thought that he was going to go and, and sacrifice Isaac, and then he was going to bring his deceased son back with him. I don't know. The Bible is not clear to me there, but he was a man of faith, and he said, we are going, and we are coming back. Verse 6, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife as the two of them went on together. Now, there are accounts that say, like, Isaac was a little boy, like five, six years old. There are some accounts that say that Isaac was in his 30s. Um, I have researched it, and I can't settle on anything other than this. Isaac had to carry the wood for his burnt offering. So I imagine he probably was not a little, little boy because that was quite a bit of wood to be carried up the mountain for the burnt offering. Guys, remember, Isaac has no idea that he is the sacrifice, but he had to carry it. So I imagine that Isaac was strong enough to be able to carry this wood up the mountain. So which indicates to me probably he's not a teeny tiny little boy. Abraham... Remember, the man's old. He's up in years, um, like over 100 by this point. So I don't know that he's actually able to wrestle his son onto the altar that he built to sacrifice him. I imagine that Isaac probably willingly laid down. Now, those are just my, where I'm thinking and I'm not pondering on it. I don't ever want you to take what I say to be it. Study the word of God for yourself. Dig in. Let this be a catapult for you, for, I, you know, I want to know more. Let's look at verse 7. Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, 
But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. So Abraham spoke in faith and confidence to his son about God's provision. Looking up the word provision in the Greek means sees. God sees. God will provide. God sees. He knows what is needed. He sees it. He will provide. Verse 9, when they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Abraham's obedience was not partial obedience. He didn't get to the first stop and say, okay, God, I've gone far enough. I know that you're going to like, deliver us now. He didn't make it up halfway to the mountain and say, okay, Lord, like, do you see how obedient I'm being? He got all the way to the point of binding his son, attaching him to the wood. Guys, does it sound like Jesus? It sounds like the sacrifice of Jesus for us. Abraham bound his son to the wood and pulled out the knife to slay him. He went that far. He didn't turn around and run away and say, okay, Isaac, you and me, we're going to go hide in a cave for the rest of our life and hide from God because he wants me to sacrifice you and I just can't do it. He goes as far as lifting up that knife to slay his son. And then, verse 11, but the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. I'm sure Abraham at that point was like, here I am. God, I've been waiting to hear from you. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Guess what, guys? God stopped Abraham because he saw Abraham's, that Abraham feared the Lord, and Abraham passed that test. A plus, you're done, you pass, you do not have to sacrifice your son. The Lord has given me plenty of tests, and I have not been as faithful as Abraham. Tests where I'm like, I cannot do this, this is way too hard. And I, you know, slowly back out. Guess what? God is not, he doesn't just give F's and like, mm, fail. He's going to give you that test again and again and again and again until you pass the test. You can either do it the hard way or the harder way. Because I'm not going to say it's easy <laughs> to obey the Lord. It's hard. It's scary. It's fearful. But I have been there where I'm like, oh, man, we are going around this mountain again. Okay, Lord. Okay, okay. Um, look at verse 13. It doesn't stop right there. This is so cool. Verse 13. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. What if, what if Abraham had not been quick to be obedient, would that ram have been caught in the thicket at that perfect time? God put it into motion, positioned, positioned everything that needed to happen, and there is the sacrifice. So guess what? They had the best worship service ever. He took Isaac off at the altar, and they went and they got the ram, and they sacrificed that ram, and those two men I'm sure worshiped and cried at the faithfulness of the Lord. Abraham had seen it once with the birth of his son Isaac in his old age, and now he sees it again that his son gets to live. That is awesome. And I'm sure Abraham's ready to skip off the mountain and have a little pep in his step because God had delivered his son and God had seen his faithfulness. But it doesn't stop there. Look at verse 14. Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. 
Jehovah Jireh. This is where Jehovah Jireh comes from. It means the Lord will provide. This name literally means in Hebrew, the Lord will see to it. He sees. He sees your need. He sees your obedience. And he sees you through. Look at verses 15 through 18. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time. I mean, once, like, hey, you don't have to kill your son. I love you. There's a ram. Yes, but a second time. Watch this. And said to Abraham, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. Because you have obeyed me. The obedience of one man completely changed the whole nation of, of Abraham. The, all of his descendants were changed and affected. It was a domino effect. Completely because Abraham was obedient. And today, I challenge you, what, if, what effect will your obedience have on your family, on the people in your workplace, on your friends? And if you are not being obedient, what are you preventing from happening? Because Abraham did this. Verse 19, then Abraham returned to his servants I'm sure with a big permagrant on his face, and they set off together for Beersheba, and Abraham stayed in Beersheba. So, God may not be asking you to sacrifice your only child, but he does call his children to a lifestyle of love-based obedience. And some of you right now are mad at me because I'm using the dirty word obedience, because obedience doesn't feel good. It don't, I know it did not feel good for Abraham to walk in obedience to the Lord. I understand fully that walking in obedience to the Lord is terrifying. And it can be very scary, but I have good news for you today. Obedience is an attitude and a lifestyle that we have to learn to embrace. It's not something that when we accept Jesus in our heart and we become Christians that we're just automatically obedient. No, guys, we still have the flesh. We still have our sinful flesh that says, no, 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 I want to be comfortable. I want to do what I want to do. Thank you. We have to put our flesh in its place, and we have to walk in obedience and embrace that lifestyle. Consider these truths that we learn from God's word. Number one, provision from Jehovah Jireh follows obedience from his children. We are not puppets on a string. We are not living in a snow globe of wonderment. We're living in a sin-filled world. And every day we have to make a choice who we are going to follow. Are we going to be obedient to our flesh or are we going to be obedient to the Lord? Blessing follows obedience. In fact, the blessing of God's abiding presence in our lives follows obedience. Jesus said it this way in the book of John, chapter 14. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. He dwells in us when we are obedient. The second thing, obeying Jehovah Jireh, especially in small matters, is an essential step in receiving his greatest blessings. Often, God's greatest blessings come as a result of our willingness to do something that appears to be insignificant. So we ask ourselves, has God been challenging me to do something seemingly unimportant that I have not yet made an effort to accomplish? Is there anything I have rationalized by saying, mm, it's too difficult, I don't want to, <laughs> my favorite, I have to pray about that. And I, guys, we should do everything in prayer. But sometimes we already know the answer. 
and we delay. It's like when I ask my children um, a homeschool question, like, Garrison, what is 25 times uh, 15? And he'll go, 25 times 15 is 25 times 15, 20, because he's trying to think. Maybe I should do an easier one. Nine times eight. Garrison, what's nine? Nine times eight. It's like an automatic knee-jerk reaction, like, I'm going to stall, and I'm going to make sure that I know it. And so sometimes we know the answer to what God has asked us to do, but we still cover it with, I'm going to pray about that. Um, Do we want to be like Abraham and be obedient when we know? Or do we want to delay our obedience and possibly be delaying blessing? It's up to us. Don't ignore the little things that God has asked you to do. Obey him. Luke chapter 16 verse 10 says it this way. He who is faithful in in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Number three, our faith in Jehovah Jireh must lead us to take decisive action. Guys, I'm the most indecisive person on the face of the planet. Going to the Cheesecake Factory to try to pick out something to eat is an ever-loving nightmare for me. Their menu is the biggest menu. on. I, I just don't even know. I'm overwhelmed. They've got everything from American to Asian food to you've got tacos, and I'm just like, I don't even know. Just order something for me. That's what I tell the server. Whatever. Just bring me something. But Our faith in Jehovah Jireh must lead us to take decisive action. So if you're indecisive like me, I understand. This is for us right now. James, the book of James, chapter 2, verses 14 through 22 says this. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace. Keep warm and well-fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead, y'all. I added the y'all. I'm sorry. Okay. But someone will say, you have faith. I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. I believe that's like said with a little bit of a, I can't do it. Never mind. Okay. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and His actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. It's super easy to say that we have faith. But when we put action behind that faith, it requires something of us more than just lip service. And that's where the Lord gets to work. My friend, writing that tithe check because she has faith turned out much better than if she had gotten her tax return the next day and like, oh, I've got money now. I'll write my tithe check. Doesn't really weigh the same, does it? She wanted to write it as soon as they got paid. She had no idea what was coming in their tax return. Number four, when we obey Jehovah Jireh, we will never be disappointed. We are so afraid that our obedience is going to lead us into something very fearful. But if we are obeying the one who made us, the one that loves us, the one that put the stars and sky and the planets in motion, and the one that keeps air in your lungs, if we are obeying him, why are we so afraid? He's got good things for us. It was, I don't even know how many years ago that God shook Brian and me, and a lot of you have heard this story, and I apologize if you've heard it for the 100,000th time from me, but some of you haven't heard this, and maybe you need to hear it today. But God took us from our little comfort in Tennessee, and our well, good-paying jobs, and said, go to Las Vegas. Ha, ha, ha. 
ah, let me pray about this. Sure did. I was like, God, I need to pray about this. Like, Brian's like, I've been praying for a while, Ashley, I'm pretty sure. Like, ah, ah. I mean, I do not get to, like, sit by Abraham um, when I get to heaven because I'm, I needed a little bit more prodding. However, however, I was afraid. We had a friend, Brian had put something on social media saying that, you know, the time was getting closer for us to leave everything that we knew and leave the comforts of home and move to the desert in June. That was really fun. Um, And... Oh, you know, right? It's it's hot. Hello. We had snow this week. All of my Tennessee friends, I love you. We had snow this week. They haven't had any, and they were very upset that we had snow in the desert this week. Side note, side note. It was a blessing and a beautiful gift from the Lord. Um, But... It was, it was terrifying. And so Brian had put something on Facebook or something saying that, you know, we were beginning this journey and we were afraid. And he got lovingly rebuked by a friend that said, you should not be afraid. However, guys, our humanity was afraid, but we were not letting our fear rule us. We were letting the fear of the Lord rule us. And we were like, Lord, you told us to go. We are going and we are doing it afraid. We are scared to death. If the Lord moves us from Vegas, guys, I will cry my eyeballs out because I love it here. I have family here. I have friends that have become family here. This is where I, you could have told me this six years ago that I would not be laying in a fetal position in the back corner of the church because I was not in my beloved hills of Tennessee. That is God. He supplied that peace for me. And I can tell you, when I loaded a van with three little boys, all in car seats or booster seats, sitting next to each other, because the back of the van was full with the rest of our stuff that didn't make it out here, and I've got to drive 27 hours across the country with three little ones that can touch each other. Like, guys, I hung, I hung up my youth card when I got a minivan. Like, here's my youth. Now I will have the minivan. I've loved it. I didn't want them to touch each other. It was great. 27 hours with them right next to each other, and they hardly ever argued. If that was not a sign of the Lord's provision, I don't even know what is. He is good. You got to step out in faith. Imagine Moses walking in obedience, going up to Pharaoh like, hey, let my people go. That's what God said. And he, he remained faithful to the Lord. I'm sure it's terrifying. Pharaoh's like, bye, guys, go. They get to the Red Sea, and we're at the Red Sea. This is awesome. Where do we pass? And the Egyptian army is on our tail. That's really fun. That's cool. Okay, Lord, I walked in obedience. I did what you said, and I don't have a clue what's going to happen right here. But the God who provides, provides in ways that we don't understand. He provides in ways that we can't. So if you don't know that story, it's very cool. God parted the Red Sea, and the Israelites walked across on dry land. And then the Egyptians followed them in there, and the Lord's like, and boom. Okay, so the Egyptians got taken care of, and the Israelites made it safely on the other side. He is the God who sees. And we are not puppets on a string. And he doesn't just, he's, we're not in this little snow globe and it's this perfect little world because, you know, sin entered. And he's not just up there as the puppeteer making sure everything happens just beautifully for us. He's our loving father that gives us free will. And he gives us this instruction book. And as long as we are doing what this tells us to do and we are trusting in the character and the nature of God, we're going to be okay. So today I have some questions for you, and I'm going to wrap this up because I know that I'm much more long-winded than Brian, Um, and I'm sorry about that last time. I think I almost went an hour last time. I apologize. I'm being much better about that this time. (laughs) Where do you need God's provision today? Are you waiting for God to provide, but you are not being obedient? 
I love y'all, but the two go hand in hand. You've got to be obedient, and then God's going to provide for you. Sometimes our obedience doesn't look as drastic as Abraham's. Maybe God isn't asking you to sacrifice your child, but maybe he is asking you to stop worshiping them and worship the one who created them. Maybe he isn't asking you to move to the mission field, but he is asking you to be loving and kind to your difficult neighbor. Maybe he isn't asking you to write a book, but he is asking you to get into his book daily. Maybe he isn't asking you to take a vow of silence, but he is asking you to come to him in prayer. Maybe God isn't asking you to speak to the masses, but he is asking you to speak respectfully to your parents or your spouse. Maybe he is asking you to give, but you're holding on to it as if it's your very last breath dependent on what he's asking you to give. Maybe he is asking you to do something a little bit more radical. Make that career change. He's been speaking to you, and you are afraid. You know in your heart, but it's too scary to make that career change. I don't know what's going to happen. Trust him. Maybe he is asking you to begin foster parenting or to adopt a child. Maybe he's burdened your heart to adopt a widow. Maybe he is asking you to move across the world and be a missionary. Maybe he's been telling you, go back to school. Maybe he's been prodding your heart to get rid of your materialistic treasures. Maybe he's asking you to seek forgiveness and make amends with someone you hurt. Maybe he's telling you to give forgiveness to somebody who hurt you. Only you know what he has asked you to do. Only you can decide to walk in obedience. And when you do, the gift of God's provision is waiting on the other side. In your worship guide today, there is a little handout. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Last time I got to speak, I shared with you guys about a very difficult time in mine and Brian's life since we moved here, where, and if you weren't here that day, I'll just recap quickly. Um, Here you go. No, never mind. I need it. He loves me and puts up with me. Um. We were getting notices on our door that we needed to pay our rent. We'd never not been able to pay our rent or our mortgage in Tennessee. Um, We didn't have groceries and people were, people did not know this. We weren't broadcasting it. We were praying and seeking the Lord and reminding him that he is Jehovah Jireh. He doesn't need reminding, but we did. If you don't know how to pray... Get into the word of God and pray his word back to him. He doesn't need it. You need to know it. He knows who he is, but he wants to know, do you know who I am? And so one day on my bathroom mirror, I drew a big circle. And I wrote in the middle of that big circle, Jehovah Jireh. And I worshiped in my bathroom that day as I cried and I wrote all the things that I needed God to provide. It was around Christmas time. My kids wanted Christmas presents because they're kids. They needed shoes because they're kids and they grow like wild maniacs and their toes were coming out on the end of their shoes. We needed groceries. We needed rent. And so I wrote and I worshiped and I left that on my mirror to see every single day that I went in there, every single time that I went in there. And it was a reminder to me that this is bigger than all of these. And so today, on this 
lovely little piece of paper. I've given you a place to write Jehovah Jireh. And for you to write the things that you need from him. But I've also given you a place. What are my next step, steps for obedience to God? Because if you are deliberately being disobedient to him. When my kids are deliberately disobedient to me, I'm not like, yes, please, let me go give you that donut you want. <laughs> right? I mean, like, seriously. But when my kids walk in obedience, I'm like, oh, they did it without arguing. Let's go get cake and ice cream and all kinds of stuff. I want to bless them. Because obedience is important. We are, we are the children of God. What is he asking you to do? I want, let's take a moment and let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word and we thank you for how you challenge us with your word. You love us so much, but you refuse to let us just live stagnant. You did not create us just to take up space, breathe the air. You created us with a purpose, Lord. And you have called us to live in obedience. You know the good and perfect gifts that you have for us on the other side of that obedience. But we have to do our part. We have to step out of that boat and keep our eyes on you, Lord. So I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room right now. Lord, I pray that you will reach into the depths of their heart. And that thing that they've shoved down and they've shoved down and they've shoved down. God, I pray that you will open their eyes to it. And that they'll write it on this paper. And then they will put action in walking in obedience to you. And Lord, you know what all of my brothers and sisters need. You know what you can see, God. You're the God that provides. You are the God who sees. So today, wherever they are, if they are in a financial bind, If their marriage feels like it's completely falling apart and they feel hopeless and they don't know what to do. If they're not sure what's going to happen to their job next week. God, I pray that they'll put it on here. And that they will begin walking in obedience to you and trusting that you are the God that sees and that you will provide for them. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to invite the worship team up. And if you have a pen, I would like for you to take a moment. And I would like for you to begin to fill out this card. Be honest. Nobody's going to see it. I'm not going to ask you to turn it in. This is for you. I want you to keep it in your Bible. I want you to go home and tape it on your bathroom mirror. Wherever it's going to be up front and obvious for you. I want you to fill it out. So pray over it right now. Let this be a time of worship for you. And before we get to that, there are some of you that might be in this room that you have no idea who this Jesus is. But all you know is you ended up here today and that you have been faced with hopelessness and you've said, I cannot do this anymore. I cannot live the life that I have been living. And I need to know this Jesus who loves me so much and can provide for my every need. So I would like to invite everyone to bow their heads, close their eyes. And pray this prayer after me. I'm inviting everybody to pray it. I never want fear to stop somebody 
from asking the Lord into their heart, fear that somebody might hear them. So church family, join with me. And if you are sitting out there, you just pray this prayer after me. It's nothing that I am saying. It's the matter of your heart and your authentic, your authenticness to God. Yes. Heavenly Father, I repent of being master of my own life and for living separate from you. I turn away from my sin and I turn to you. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord and my Savior. I welcome you, Holy Spirit, into my life to rescue and empower me and to restore me to intimacy with my heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, we give you praise. We worship you, Lord. We thank you for life change. We thank you that the heavens are celebrating today over names being written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me today, friends, I invite you to do several things. Come back to church next Sunday. Make church attendance a priority. Why do we need to make church attendance a priority? It's because it's where we link arms. It's where we can fuel up. It's where we can lean on one another, pray together, cry together, laugh together. On your connection card, mark it if you accepted the Lord today. Sign up to be water baptized. That is just kind of like a wedding ceremony. <laughs> it's where you go into the water saying, the old me is gone, and you are raised up, and you say, and the new me is here, and I am never going back to the old me. Attend the growth track and get plugged.